can, can join us in progress. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody who made time to be with us here today. I realize everyone has a, has a busy schedule. Uh, I'm delighted to be moderating this event to launch the report, Who Will Be Left to Defend Human Rights? Persecution of Online Expression in the Gulf and Neighboring Countries, which is a joint collaboration between the International Human Rights Law Clinic at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law and the Gulf Center for Human Rights. I'd also like to thank the Norwegian Human Rights Fund who put us together for this project. The report has just been put online and is available on our website and at the law clinics. Uh, we'll put links in the chat. Just a few words about my organization. The Gulf Center for Human Rights works to protect human rights defenders in the Gulf region and neighboring states. We document human rights abuses, support human rights defenders in the field, and advocate on their behalf, including those facing detention. Regarding the event, we're planning for about an hour, 45 minutes for the speakers and 15 minutes for questions. Please put your questions in the chat, but feel free to send them as they arise. It's appreciated if you can identify yourself. The research team have agreed to stay longer uh, if, there, if there are additional questions. Before we hear from the research team though, I would like to ask Clement Voul, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Association to give opening remarks. Clement, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, let me first thank uh, uh, Gulf Center for this invitation. Uh, I welcome this important study conducted by the International Human Rights Law Clinic at the University of California, Berkeley, and the Gulf Center for Human Rights that reveals revel a worrying trend of governments in the Gulf and neighbor countries using anti cyber crime and other laws to criminalize and clamp down on online expression, and which is critical uh, uh, to the work of civil society. Digital space are essential for civil society actors in the Gulf region to reclaim their rights to freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, and of association as states step up clamping down on this offline. We see more and more people moving to online platform and social media to express their view, to associate in group and to mobilize, to advocate for respect and protection of their human rights. As you highlighted in this study, I have observed an increased trend of states adopting and using law, criminalizing access to and use of digital tools in a diverse range of countries, including the Gulf region. I have raised concern over the state's use of cybercrime law, anti-terrorism law, surveillance law, and law against protests, which establish criminal liability in often vague and ill-defined terms to repress activists online. Starting in 2020, we have seen a number of states, including Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, use the COVID-19 pandemic as a pretext to exacerbate this pre-existing pattern. As the virus began to spread in the region, all of these governments issue statements warning of criminal liability for publishing false news or spreading misinformation. And in many cases, they have prosecuted individuals who posted content on social media about the pandemic or the government's response. The repression of freedom of expression online can also constitute violation to the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association as this prevents and criminalize people associating or mobilizing community online by sharing critical contents and advocating for a change. For example, in my reports in 2019 on the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association in the digital age, I highlight the case of Saudi Arabia women human rights defenders who were opposing driving bans and were prosecuted in terrorism-related case 
including for incitement to protest, attempting to inflame public opinion, and filming protests and publishing on social media. Dissent is a legitimate part of the exercise of peaceful assembly and association rights and should be protected online and offline. No person should be held criminally, civilly, or administratively liable for organizing, advocating, or participating in a peaceful protest or for establishing or operating an association for a lawful purpose. This law don't leave much room for legitimate dissent and criticism. For example, Article 20, 29 of the EAU cybercrime law makes it illegal to damage the reputation, prestige, or status of the states. Such vague wording gives prosecutors extensive room to criminalize many types of legitimate speech and leave judges with little ground to rule in favor of defenders. As I stated in my 2019 reports to the Human Rights Council, international law protects the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association, whether exercised in person through technology of today or through technology that will be invented in the future. That is why I call on states to revise and amend cybercrime, surveillance, and anti-terrorism law and bring them into compliance with international human rights norms and standards governing the right to peaceful assembly and of association and the right to freedom of expression. I have also called on the digital technology companies to respect freedom of peaceful assembly and association and carry out due diligence to ensure that they do not cause, contribute to or become complicit in violation of these rights. To that end, the effective implementation of the guiding principle on business and human rights should be a priority for these companies. Also, I have called on third countries, such as on Israel, to ensure technology such as Pegasus spyware that is being used to launch cyber attack against civil society actors, including in the Gulf region, has not been solved or used by states that violate human rights, including freedom of assembly and association. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing more the finding from your important research and recommendation on how to improve the environment for online activists to express, associate, and mobilize online free from reprisal. This is also very important for me as I'm conducting consultation to report to the Human Rights Council on how to strengthen protection of human rights in the context of peaceful protests in crisis situation. And as we see that during crises such as COVID-19, Many activists have moved online to exercise their rights. Thank you again, and I'm, I will be happy to listen to you and, and, and to, to learn more about the research. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Clement. Um, well, I, I really appreciate the uh, connection you made between the, the freedoms of expression and the freedoms of association. Uh, I, I think that those two freedoms go so much hand in hand that uh, the, 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 this research will, will have a, an impact as well on, on the work that you're trying to, doing, trying to do and, and shows just how broadly uh, attacks on uh, freedom, of, freedom of speech uh, impact uh, human rights. Uh, now I would like to introduce the research team uh, from uh, Berkeley's International Human Rights Law Clinic, uh, who will speak in the following order. Uh, first of all, uh, Laura Fletcher, who is the professor of law uh, uh, at the, the Berkeley School of Law, and she co-directs the clinic. She'll be followed by two anonymous uh, student researchers, uh, and then uh, the, the conclusions and findings will be presented by Asta Sharma Kokarl, who is a, a teaching fellow at the clinic. Uh, Laurel, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. 
I co-direct the International Human Rights Law Clinic at the University of California, Berkeley. The clinic has been around for over 20 years, working to support the work of frontline human rights defenders. And so it's a great privilege to partner with GCHR. In this current climate of hostility to human rights and those who support them, we have to redouble our efforts to protect defenders. Building international networks to support defenders as the Norwegian Human Rights Fund has demonstrated is critical to this work. And this collaboration is a testament to what can be accomplished. We need to improve the climate for, def for defenders and this need is urgent. For without defenders, human rights will simply wither. So today's report is on persecution of defenders in the Gulf and neighboring, region, country, neighboring countries for their online expression. So a word about why this focus. Because attacks on human rights defenders are a longstanding issue. What's new is that as so many aspects of our lives involve online communication, governments have adapted their tools of repression to take account of this online environment. Anti-cybercrime laws are one such tool. In its 2018 report, GCHR analyzed domestic cybercrime laws in the region, and this report builds on and complements that work. In the Gulf and neighboring countries, targeting happens at the local level, but as we pull back the frame and look nationally and regionally, we see a larger pattern. The report finds that governments are using very similar legal techniques to criminalize online expression of defenders. The, the legal climate therefore contributes to an increasingly general hostile climate for, the, for human rights activism. So today's report sheds light on two questions. One, what is the legal environment governments have created to control online expression? And two, what can we learn from the reported incidents about how governments are deploying these laws to target defenders? We answer these questions through a human rights lens. The report analyzes the extent to which the relevant domestic laws comply with international human rights laws and standards. We looked at incidents reported since the publication of GCHR's report and focused on the period since that time, May 2018 through October of 2020. Our principal finding is that based on our analysis of 225 incidents across 10 countries, we find credible evidence of widespread and systematic persecution of defenders for online expression that is protected under international law. Finally, the report serves as a resource. It provides an accessible overview of the domestic legal environment for online expression in each country and pulls out the trends for uh, the particular countries as well as across the region regarding what, what types of defenders are being targeted and for what kinds of expression. I will say a few words about the methods we used for the study. First, we identified the relevant domestic laws that governments use throughout the, the 10 countries to regulate online expression. These include anti-cybercrime legislation, but in fact, we see that governments rely on penal codes and other media regulations that criminalize expression protected by international law. Second, we analyze the extent to which the laws as written comply with international human rights laws and standards. Third, to understand the effects of these laws, we identified credible reports of governments targeting of human rights defenders for online expression published by highly regarded independent NGOs, media news outlets, and in communications from special procedures. This method yielded 225 credible in incidents offering evidence of violations of defenders' rights to online freedom of expression. These are classic cases of legalized repression of free expression. However, just because governments apply domestic criminal laws to quash online expression doesn't make this conduct legal under international law. Unfortunately, the international community has enabled regional use of anti-cybercrime legislation that violates freedom of expression. So how so? In general, the UN has encouraged the promulgation and harmonization of domestic anti-cybercrime laws. 
In the Gulf region, this harmonization has taken a pernicious form of incorporating offline content restrictions found in domestic penal codes into model anti-cybercrime laws. And this is true for the Arab League model law and other countries have followed suit. The UN bodies that ha have examined the regional laws and the Arab Convention left the problematic and dangerous content restrictions largely unchallenged. This has left it to UN human rights mechanisms, in particular special procedures, to address the predictable fallout of these laws. And governments are able to justify repressive acts against online expression by saying these, these are laws that have received tacit international approval. This gap can be understood as the result of insufficient integration of human rights concerns across UN se sectors involved in anti-cybercrime work. And while governments throughout the region are immediately responsible for the violations we document, the violations also reflect the attention deficit of the international community to the human rights implications of anti-cybercrime approach that it, that it has endorsed. Defenders in the region are paying a very high price for this oversight. I'm now gonna turn to two student researchers from the clinic to present our principal findings. Then my colleague, Asta Sharma Pokhrel, will discuss our conclusions and recommendations. Thank you. Hello. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm a student researcher at the International Human Rights Law Clinic, and I will kick off our discussion about the main findings of our study. To begin our conversation, I will walk us through the ways, in the, the ways states in the Gulf region are targeting online expression, particularly with regards to content protected by Article 19 of the UDHR and the ICCPR, as well as examples of other rights violations. When we examined all 10 countries, it became clear that there was a regional pattern in which authorities targeted online expression by human rights defenders who expressed opinions and views officials deemed critical of the state or its foreign policy. Often, states use criminal defamation or insult provisions to do this. For example, in Kuwait, authorities arrested journalist and writer Aisha al-Rashid in January 2019. Al-Rashid was previously recorded speaking publicly against government corruption. Clips of her speaking were shared on social media platforms, including WhatsApp. This led to the Kuwaiti office of the Emir filing five complaints against her with the Department of Cybercrimes, which ultimately led to her arrest. The government charged El Rashid under Article 6 of the Cybercrime Law for criticizing the Emir. This is an important example as a special rapporteur on freedom of expression has particularly emphasized states cannot limit freedom of expression in order to prevent criticisms against the government. To do so is to create an environment of suppression and is in violation of rights protected under Article 19. Further, government authorities in Bahrain, Jordan, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE targeted human rights defenders for criticizing the foreign policy or foreign interests of the state. For example, in Oman, between October and December 2018, the government arrested several human rights defenders for social media posts about Palestinian rights. These arrests coincided with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's visit to the country that October. The government didn't prosecute those advocating for Palestinian human rights without violating any specific law, but the human rights defenders were detained for long periods of time. Targeting the online speech of human rights defenders who advocate for Palestinian rights violates international standards on freedom of expression, as a discussion of government policy, including foreign policy, is a protected right. In all of the countries, authorities targeted speech that was seen as anti-government because it addressed the inequalities that minorities, minority communities or women face. For example, in May 2018, in Saudi Arabia, there were mass arrests of women human rights defenders who were advocating online for reforms, such as the right to drive for women in Saudi, as well as challenging the guardianship requirement. Following the arrests, several of the women human rights defenders were tried and subsequently charged under the cybercrime law. Saudi Arabia's cybercrime law, which was passed in 2007, has been subject to heavy international scrutiny and criticism. One of the women, Lujain Ahaluth, an activist and blogger had her case transferred to the specialized criminal court where she was sentenced to a five-year travel ban and was only conditionally released in February, 2021. Al-Hathlul was found guilty of broad terrorism charges such as spying with foreign parties and conspiring against the kingdom. Since her release, she has spoken about the torture she'd faced while she was in custody. 
States in the region violated the freedom of association rights of human rights defenders by targeting their online expression. In Iraq and Jordan, there were credible reports that law enforcement directly targeted activists in the country for post-organizing anti-government protests. An example of this is in Jordan, where in 2020, authorities made a wave of arrests during a mass protest by the teachers syndicate after the government reportedly did not honor its promise to raise teacher salary. In July of 2020, law enforcement closed all branches of the teacher syndicate and arrested the board members. The attorney general stated that one reason for the arrests was a video posted to social media platforms made by the deputy head of the syndicate. Following these arrests, there was a gag order imposed on anyone report any reporting of the case, including through social media. Targeting the right to online expression regarding protests taking place in real time has implications for a number of interconnected rights, including the right to freedom of assembly and the freedom of association. International human rights bodies have explicitly emphasized that states have the obligation to protect the rights to freedom of assembly and association, both online and offline. Associated activities such as disseminating information and communication between participants is essential to exercising these rights. And finally, there was a serious pattern of additional violations of human rights related to the arrest of human rights defenders for online expression, which includes incommunicado detention, enforced disappearances, torture, and arbitrary deprivation of life. There were reported cases of one or more of each type of these violations in every country except Bahrain. For example, in Iraq, Ali Jessab Hattab al Haliji, a human rights defender and attorney who was representing individuals arrested in connection to protests, was abducted. Prior to his disappearance, al Haliji received death threats and warnings to stop speaking about the demonstrations. Iraq is party to the Convention on Enforced Disappearances which outlines that enforced disappearances are an international crime that cannot be justified and that is prohibited by customary law. His whereabouts are still unknown to this day. I will now turn things over to my colleague to continue our discussion of findings. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Like my colleague, I am a student researcher at the International Human Rights Law Clinic. I will be presenting the remaining findings of our report. I am going to outline the tactics that governments in the Gulf region have used to infringe the right to freedom of expression online. I will focus on four tactics, the criminalization of protected expression through legislation, the creation of specialized enforcement institutions, the use of surveillance, and transnational collaboration by states to target human rights defenders. First, I would like to discuss the use of arbitrary laws restricting freedom of expression. Through our study, we found that governments used vague, overbroad, and disproportionate provisions in anti-cybercrime laws, penal codes, counterterrorism, and press or media laws to criminally prosecute human rights defenders for their online expression. Across the region, we found that these types of laws included similarly vague language such as prohibitions on expression that infringes on public order or criminal rather than civil defamation provisions. Nine of the 10 countries in this study have enacted anti-cybercrime laws. The Iraqi government has considered an anti-cybercrime law, but has not yet adopted one. All of the laws enacted include content-based restrictions on online expression that violate the international right to freedom of expression. One such example of an anti-cybercrime law provision used to criminalize online expression, Article 6 of Qatar's 2014 Cybercrime Prevention Act is on the screen. The false news and public order provisions in this article violate international standards, including those in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, mandating legality, necessity, and proportionality for any restrictions on freedom of expression. The vagueness and overbreadth of these provisions enable arbitrary enforcement. Second, we found that each of the nine states in our study that have enacted anti-cybercrime laws also created specialized legal infrastructures. These enforcement units or courts investigate or prosecute violations of online content restrictions. Courts dedicated to prosecuting cybercrimes posed threats to human rights defenders given their lack of due process protections. 
For example, the specialized criminal court in Saudi Arabia can permit pretrial and incommunicado detention for lengthy periods and has reportedly relied on confessions obtained through torture. As the previous researcher noted, this court was used to try several human rights defenders as a result of their online advocacy. Third, we found that governments in the region engaged in expansive surveillance in a way that infringes the right to privacy. Governments in Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE reportedly surveilled or gained access to private communications of human rights defenders whom the government targeted for their online expression. There was evidence that the Omani, Saudi, and UAE governments had used the Pegasus spyware program to infect mobile phones of human rights defenders. Pegasus, which is manufactured by the company NSO Group, is a malware that infects Apple and Android phones. Earlier versions required the target to click on a link sent via text, while later versions are zero click, meaning a phone can be infected without the target clicking on a suspicious link. Once a phone is infected, the malware allows the spyware user to access data, including text messages and passwords, as well as turn on the phone's microphone and camera to record nearby activity. Lastly, our research revealed a pattern of transnational collaboration, including abductions by states in the Gulf region to target human rights defenders. The study found several reported incidents in which governments collaborated with each other to punish online advocacy they found detrimental to their allies or to their own foreign policy. In one egregious example, Iraqi intelligence officials and Iranian authorities cooperated to arrest and abduct Iranian journalist Rahola Zam from Iraq and bring him to Iran. Zam operated the news channel Ahmad News on the app Telegram, which had posted videos of protests in 2017 and 2018. In Iran, after the abduction, Zam was tried, convicted of spreading corruption on earth, and executed in a matter of months. Targeting Zam for disseminating critical news online violates international protections. And further, Iran violated international law by imposing the death penalty, which is reserved for intentional killing. The lethal risks of transnational cooperation to target defenders is chillingly apparent in the Zam case. Now, I will turn it over to Asta, who will discuss the recommendations contained in the report. Thank you. Uh, so I want to end our presentation by discussing some of the recommendations that we offer in the report. Some of the recommendations are to states uh, that are the subject of this report. Others are to all states and others are to the UN Human Rights Council, specifically OHCHR. So as we described, there's been a regional approach to developing anti-cybercrime legislation that has resulted in cybercrime laws that are extremely vague and overbroad in violation of international standards. As Professor Fletcher described earlier, the international community has promoted this approach to cybercrime legislation and has not paid adequate attention to the consequences of this. So our recommendations really underscore the need for regional and international uh, collaboration. So first we have a set of uh, state specific recommendations, which I'm not going to go into great detail into as they're uh, contained in the country chapters and they're pretty um, state specific. But in broad terms, we recommend that states eliminate those provisions that effectively criminalize protected expression, whether it's in the cybercrime legislation and the terrorism legislation in the penal code or in other laws um, uh, in these countries. So these are provisions that are so vague and overbroad that they can, they can be and they are abused by states to target whatever conduct they deem as, um, contrary to their interests. So for example, these are criminal insult and defamation laws. These are public order provisions, uh, like what one of the student researchers uh, was just talking about. These are broad terrorism provisions. And we also found that in some states, there was a unique impact of criminalization on non-citizens. So namely the threat of deportation. Some of these laws contain deportation as a possible consequence. Um, of, of protected expression. So we recommend that states decriminalize and stop using deportation as punishment for online expression. 
We also have a recommendation to all states. So another one of the student researchers mentioned that we found a serious pattern of states using surveillance technology to target human rights defenders. And this is, of course, particularly dangerous to human rights advocacy because of the impact that surveillance and even just the threat of potential surveillance has on an advocate's ability to speak and organize freely. So we underscore human rights experts recommendation that there be a global moratorium on the acquisition, sale and use of surveillance technology until there's adequate safeguards in place. And finally, we have a set of recommendations to OHCHR. And we think OHCHR is particularly well suited to engage in these studies that I'm going to describe because these studies require independence, they require human rights expertise and a regional, international and transnational perspective. And these studies should serve as the basis for decisions on how to eliminate these practices uh, that states are using to target human rights defenders online advocacy. So first we recommend a, a surveillance related study. We recommend that OHCHR undertake a study to identify and track developments in the surveillance regimes in each state in the region. So we think this is important um, to getting an understanding of the nature and scope of the problem in this region. And we think this study should be used to enable UN human rights bodies to make decisions on how to curb these abuses. We think that governments in question should, of course, cooperate in the study. Um, but we think the study should also identify businesses and third party states that contribute to advancing the surveillance infrastructure in each state uh, concerned. And then finally, we have a recommendation on related to the transnational collaboration on renditions. Uh, where states reach beyond their territorial jurisdictions to detain, render, and in some cases, torture and execute human rights defenders. And the impacts of this are, of course, extremely serious. Human rights defenders are not safe often when they're inside the state where they're advocating for human rights, where they're criticizing their state's policy. And this trend shows that they're not safe uh, often outside of it either. And again, OHCHR's attention to this issue and its positioning as an independent international body is extremely valuable. And the study should serve as a basis for other human rights bodies who are determining how to ensure an elimination of this trend. Thank you so much. I'm now gonna pass the presentation um, back to Michael. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Asta. And I, I really would like to take this moment to thank you, the team at Berkeley, um, and especially the, the student researchers who participated but, uh, but weren't able to, to, to present today. Um, I think this is, uh, for working in Geneva on advocacy, I find this an incredibly valuable tool, a very useful tool, and I look forward to, to, to working with it uh, more closely. Um, in the meantime, I'm now going to ask my colleague, who is the uh, uh, digital rights officer, uh, and, and a focal point uh, with you on this project to, to make some comments. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you, Laurel, the student researchers and Asta for the summary of the report. I'd first like to highlight that this report, um, it's, it's quite compact, it's very comprehensive as well. It presents a context, contextualized legal analysis documenting who was penalized and how the types of speech criminalized followed by the prescriptions and recommendations that Asta just shared with us. Um, it's also a comprehensive account for a very important moment time, of time um, in the region. It covers key events such as the wave of arbitrary arrests of human and women's rights defenders in Saudi Arabia, protests in Iraq, as well as the first stages of the pandemic. And as we all know, these were quite important moments formative of how much restrictions have been increased on freedom of expression. Um, I'd like to invite our discussant, Dr. Khulud Khatib, the University of Associate Professor of International Law and Human Rights, as well as the co-founder and the president of the Lebanese Organization for Defending Equality and Rights. I would like you to share your reflections and comments on the report findings and recommendations as a legal scholar, as well as a human rights defender. What do you think of the, of the findings? Um, how do you think this work can be used in your human rights work, but also what can we do next with this? Thank you so much. Many thanks for the Gulf Center for Human Rights and the Human Rights Clinic at Berkeley University for this extremely important and vibrant event. Well, focusing on, on the human uh, rights in the digital age is really very important. 
despite the fact that the online space is crucial to empower, to inform, to investigate, to defend and to promote human rights, it is also very critical as a human rights issue. While the human rights defenders are using and should use the online uh, communication to organize, protest and advocate for the human rights, the government at the same time are adapting their laws and enforcement strategies to restrict expressions. We need to know that this, this research is really very, very valuable. The data collected and the comprehensive approach of this research is considered a very valuable tool and resources for, 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 I mean, for researchers, for academic, for human rights defenders, for people who work well, uh, for human rights and on human rights. It provides very good, strong analysis for the legal system that combines the legal framework, but in addition to the practical cases that can tell us and show us a real evaluation of what's going on on the ground. It is true that once we regulate online public space, we determine what the people are able to say and what they can hear in a world that's becoming a very dominant place for public debate. However, any kind of regulation we're talking about goes beyond ethical framework. It really consists of a legal foundation of how states can build their responses to the protection of human rights in digital age. When we come to this important uh, report, and of course, not all the cases are violated, 225 cases from 2018 to 2020 can really show us how a clear pattern throughout the region indicates of how government, they, they seek to strictly control and limit the expression of, 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 what they, of cases they do not agree on. We are in the MENA region of really in need for such a kind of research that provides very clear guidance of what is considered an as acceptable behavior on the half of a behalf in the states, but in light of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, numerous convention treaties, but also court jurisdictions. The reality tells us the opposite. The government's regulations of the online space and the fundamental guarantees for the rule of law are not respected. The, the, the report shows very clear a path that how anti cyber crimes and other relevant roles are creating a hostile climate for the online freedoms of the expression of the human rights defenders. It indicates a very um, alerting, um, alerting um, sign of how human rights defenders are criminalized through the laws and through judicial procedures, how they are being silenced, how they are being punished, but also we go beyond than this. A lot of violations, as I have seen within the reports, targeting women rights defenders, uh, moving up with the freedom of associations, as Clement was saying, uh, detention, the enforced disappearance, the torture, the online surveillance. So all of these indicate how, how patterns we have regarding the human rights violations. Actually, it raises the responsibility of how we can share responsibility regarding all of these challenges. Like, I believe the answer is like the responsibility for all of one of us. It's very important that we share responsibility and ownership for, for, for the need for universal human response to defend the human rights. We share responsibilities as businesses, as you have said within your recommendations, as academics, to have an in-depth raising awareness for students about the importance of, of, uh, of, of such a knowledge that they can get with such an in-depth and in-kind research as journalists, as parliaments to legislate the laws, as human rights defenders. It is of extreme importance to look at the compliance of the national laws that we have in our, in our countries in, 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 in compliance with the international conventions. Actually, the importance of such a kind of effort is a call urgent for all the states in order to eliminate the laws and articles in their national legal framework that criminalize the online freedom of expression, to have more reform in the legal constitutions and ensure that HRDs and citizens have a full potential accessibility for offline and online uh, uh, work of human rights. We, as defenders, as activists, reject all the persecution and all the violations for digital rights defenders. We need to work in a defense for, for um, uh, to have a space for them to work within public interest and recognize the work at the legal, at the social, and also at the political level. 
the, the research is such a valuable research. It really relies on data uh, with all the analysis of the legal framework, with all the cases documented. I think it will gonna be a very valuable asset for defenders, for academics, and also for researchers, for students in the MENA. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much for, for, for those reflections and, and insight into that. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat just yet, uh, but I invite you to uh, submit, uh, submit questions if you would like to, but I will start with one uh, uh, if, if, if possible, and it, it's, it's for, the, for the law clinic. Um, I, I think when we went back into the uh, genealogy, um, you, you noted that in almost, you know, one year, uh, each year over the past uh, uh, 20 years, there has been a new law and, and they all seem to have a root in discussions that were held at the UN, uh, at the West Asia, um, the, the West Asia regional body. And, and I'm just wondering if you could expand on that, and maybe talk about the the, the, the effect of that and, and maybe how you would see that, that that does not repeat itself. And I'll, I'll leave that open to, to either uh, Laurel, you can answer it or, or maybe, maybe some of your, your, your colleagues would, uh, anyone else is welcome to jump in, of course. Thank you. Excuse me, thank you, Michael, for the, for the question. Um, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really interesting aspect of, of the research um, that we weren't expecting when, when we looked at this because we started by looking at the, at the laws as they were written. But when we, when we began to kind of get into the history of how they, they came to be legislated, you, we see the, the fingerprints of, um, of UN involvement in various ways. So, um, you know, so as you said, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia or um, ECWA um, was involved um, you know, with UNESCO, the UNESCO Cairo office for Arab states authored this Beirut declaration, which was a statement of principles to guide the development of information and communication technologies throughout the region, right? So that, that starts to set up this, this framework. It's not law, but it establishes a, a framework. Uh, within that framework, um, states are promulgating draft legislation. So for example, cyber anti-cyber crime legislation was drafted by the UAE um, and um, and, and ECSPA stated, looked at the UAE national law, which was based on the UAE proposed model and says, this complies with European standards on cybercrime legislation. Well, it also does a few other things, right? In terms of content restriction, but um, you know, ECSPA acknowledged those concerns, but it didn't go any farther. It didn't say, you know, this, um, it, it didn't really um, forcefully interrupt that legislative process. Um, there were no strong statements that were issued. And so that kind of soft peddling, I think, you know, we see the effects of that. When there isn't a forceful international intervention that says, listen, we know what these laws have been used for, right? Because these, these are content restrictions that pre-existed and they're just being written in in that sense, modernized in terms of um, uh, of the uh, of, of the cyber age, and we see these with predictable results. So, at the first instance, you know that's not under UN special procedures. That's not part of the human human rights mechanism. Um, Exwa is off in a different sphere in uh, you know in the alphabet city of of United Nations international. Um, regulations and governance. And so the question is, so why, why isn't every aspect of the UN that touches um, cybercrime policy and legislation taking the human rights implications seriously? It's just not enough to note, oh, there may be some issues here. There need, we, we know what happens. Um, we shouldn't be surprised that when you write in or allowed to be written in these content re restrictions that are criminalized, that we're going to see these predictable results. So um, that's I'll, I'll stop there. But we can um, uh, we, we see that type of hands off approach um, just has uh, literally lethal consequences. 
Okay. I, I'm looking into the. I don't see any questions in the chat. We do have an audience, but we're they're 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 remarkably uh, they're remarkably quiet. Um, I I think um, I I would like to remind everyone that we do have links uh, both to the uh, law clinic and to uh, the Gulf Center, uh, and you can find the reports on there. Um, I uh, as as there aren't a. A lot of questions. What I will do is just give uh, each of the speakers who would like to uh, a chance to make a, a, a final comment or a final minute. We're almost at the end of the hour in any case, um, and give a chance for uh, for any uh, any any last comments that they would like to make. Maybe I'll leave uh, Laurel for last, as as you just answered the the, the question. Um, but maybe I can open it up to your to your to your team and and then and then to conclude. Thank you, Michael. I, I just wanted to sort of add something to what Laurel was just saying and and uplifting this the specific role that special rapporteurs have played um, and, and how much we relied on on the statements of special rapporteurs to help us in our analysis of these um, of these laws. Uh, and as Laurel described, at the same time as there's this parallel uh, sort of attempt to um, legislate cybercrime legislation, the UN Special Rapporteurs are also sort of criticizing this legislation in a way that uh, sort of underscores and uplifts the human rights implications of this. Um, and so you see that in the cybercrime legislation and of course other legislation realm as well, but you also see it in the really sort of urgent context of, of surveillance. Um, and the way in which a couple of years ago, a special rapporteur called for the moratorium of, of the acquisition sale and use of surveillance technology and special rapporteurs, uh, again, this year, um, after, after significant relevant revelations of the use of surveillance technology to, um, to target human rights defenders, again, called for this moratorium. And so, um, so I just I want to end and, and just to say that these that uh, that there's really significant consequences of both the laws, but then also the extra legal ways in which governments are surveilling and targeting human rights defenders um, and the importance of sort of taking seriously these consequences and addressing them in the strongest way that the international community possibly can before, uh, before, as Laurel said, I mean, these lethal, lethal consequences um, continue. I'll, uh, I'll thank you for that. Maybe uh, if, if either of the student researchers would like to make a, a, a comment on anything that, that struck them particularly. I would say thank you to everyone who attended today. We really appreciate it. and. I really want to uplift um, what Dr. Khatib uh, said about the fact that this is everyone's responsibility to protect and defend the rights to freedom of expression, privacy, and freedom of association. And this is truly a global problem, even though our report focuses on one specific region, it really does implicate all of us and is an important issue for all of us to, uh, to think about. So thank you to everyone who took time out of your day to come and listen to us. Any other? Open it to the to you, to to your fellow student. Nothing much to add except again to extend thanks to everyone um, for such a wonderful um, presentation and to also sort of highlight what Professor Fletcher Asta and Professor Katib are saying about the importance of the incidents themselves and the human rights defenders sort of being depicted um, and their stories being documented in the report was really um, wonderful to work on and sort of capturing the human rights abuses that were happening. But thank you all so much. Great, thank you. Um, Laurel, uh, Laurel, do you have any, any, any added comments? Um, just, just quickly to say that, um, that I hope um, OHCHR takes up these recommendations and uses its resources to, uh, to conduct further study. I really think that um, both in the, in the area of, of state surveillance 
and use of private surveillance technologies and the human rights implications is crying out for further investigation and the transnational cooperation uh, to persecute human rights defenders is truly, truly frightening. Uh, when we have extraterritorial exercise of, uh, um, of human rights violations with state cooperation, it literally globalizes persecution and creates um, creates a dragnet for human rights defenders. And I think this is, a, uh, you know, what we're seeing um, in this region is does not capture um, the whole picture. And I think this would be an important first step to, uh, to highlight uh, and bring much needed attention to the very, very dangerous um, trend that this pretends. So on that less uplifting note, um, I look forward to comments from, from the other panelists here. Uh, before I put Clement on the hot seat, I, I won't make him responsible for everything the UN does, but I will ask you afterwards to, to, to speak about the, the, the dynamic between the special procedures and, and the wider UN. Um, I'm saying that just to give you a few moments to think about it. Um, while I ask Khulud uh, Khatib uh, for, 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 for any last thoughts from you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I, I just want to start with, uh, with a Laurel uh, word as a dangerous trend. And really, it is a dangerous trend and going like a very global threat, not only at the level of a state, but if we can see how those states collaborate together in order like to push to have more restrictions on, on the cyber uh, on the cyberspace as we can see that we are in a digital age everything is relied on 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 data internet has become one of the basic the basic right and a basic platforms for human right defenders so I I guess it is like um, it is very important to 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 to, to, to confess here that we still have a deficiency of the international community to have real uh, protections for for and and um, and procedures taken within the states for the measures taken, I, I repeat my words: the compliance between the national laws and the international treaty is really a necessity. The measures for the implication of the national laws in light of the international treaties is a must. Having all these international standards within, within, without real implication and, uh, and protection for, uh, for, 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 for the laws, we still have a lot of deficiency. And again, I share it's the responsibility for all of us to, have, uh, to raise the voice and to, to collaborate our actions together to highlight and ask for the responsibility for the protection for human rights. Thank you so much. Thank you for those comments. I, I think of, of all the people on the panel, you're, you're the one that touched uh, most immediately uh, by this and, and, I, and you can hear it in your, in your voice. Thank you for, for that. Now I'm going, to leave, I'm going to leave the last word uh, to, to, to Clement, having, having uh, warned him that I would put him in the hot seat. Uh, um, but uh, it, it would be good to hear your thoughts on how you, how you, you see the dynamic between uh, the special procedures and, and, and the wider UN and the, the dangers the, the, the research outlined. Well, thank, 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 thank you very much, uh, Michael. And first of all, let me thank also all the, um, uh, this, the research team, the Berkeley University, uh, the Law Clinic, and also for this fantastic work, uh, which also confirmed uh, what we have been also monitoring in the region. Uh, I think the advantage of this report is really to have this comprehensive analysis on uh, uh, anti cybercrime crime laws uh, uh, that are adopted in, in, in the region to capture uh, uh, online speech. Um, let, me, let, let me also say that this, this is important for us as a uh, UN wide because it also helps us to really understand the trends. I know some recommendation uh, made request some more research and uh, analysis on uh, by OSHR. Uh, but I think uh, th th this, is, th th this is something that I'm sure OSHR also will, will, will think carefully. But I would like to talk uh, at the level of the special rapporteur, we, are, we receive quite a lot. If you look at some of our recent communication, uh, it also did mainly 
uh, about online um, harassment, online surveillance, but also the, the, the anti-crime uh, crime laws that are adopted by many states. Um, so this report provides us the tools that help us now to really be more comprehensive, but also uh, to see within the system wide how we can collaborate when it comes to deal with um, with these anti cyber crime laws. Um, I just wanted to say something that I, I, I during the consultation that I organized in 2019, leading to my reports on uh, uh, freedom of peaceful assembly and association in digital. Uh, I, this consultation was exactly in Eastern, in, uh, I think it was in, uh, in uh, Beirut, where I think many Gulf uh, human rights defenders told me that they are walking away from online space because it becomes very dangerous. It's not safe for them. And I think this report also shows that, that online space is becoming a very, very difficult space for Gulf uh, civil society, human rights defenders to engage. And this is why it's important. And because of this high level of risk that defenders are facing, it's important for the system wide and in particular special procedure to really tackle this challenge. Um, in terms of recommendation, as you know, some of the recommendations that you made in our in, in, in the report, they concur with some of the recommendations also we already made in, in our reports, including uh, uh, imposing moratorium on the sort of this uh, the, the, uh, the equipment and and and, uh, and uh, spyware that are used by government to to survey uh, human rights defenders online. Um, it also some of these recommendations are also important in a way also that it also help us in in currently in our discussion with companies because one of the things that we need also to understand is also that the company has also an important role to play in, in, in this and, and because there are those who are producing this material and because we have been uh, raising this many times i raised it i raised it in also in uh, silicon valley with many companies uh, on the need for company really to do uh, uh, human rights assessments, uh, human rights impact assessments when it comes to the producing and also putting in, a, in some of their equipments. Uh, but unfortunately, we are seeing that uh, it must really happen because of their business model and a lot of justification being that these materials are sent to the camp, to the government to fight against terror. But we know that in reality, it isn't. Uh, and the anti civil crime law are just increasing this kind of online, online uh, threat that uh, civil society is facing. So for us, it's, it's really important to look at this comprehensively and see how we can tackle them. But I just wanted to say that um, within the system wide, it's a big concern uh, for all of the mandate. My mandate um, uh, is really concerned, uh, the mandate of women, all the mandates, if you look at them, all of them have uh, a report or analysis on digital space in relation to their specific mandate, meaning that this space is becoming important uh, and um, it's becoming critical that this report will also help all of us to really look at uh, how we can tackle these challenges um, in different angle, in the angle of each of us mandates. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, event, but also for putting out this research. And uh, we will be happy to continue uh, this um, uh, this discussion. But I will also say that keeping monitoring what is happening and being able to continue to send us cases, uh, it will be really helpful and uh, really trying to kind of mitigate these challenges. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clement. And uh, I would like to just say, uh, I'm, I'm going to slowly come to a close now. Um, I want to thank uh, all the panelists for, who have given their time and especially the research team who have put in a year's work on, on the report. 
Uh, I'd like to thank our attendees who, uh, who, who have stuck with us. The number has remained steady to, through the whole time. Thank you very much. I hope you uh, download the report and I hope you have a chance to, to read it. The executive summary at the very least is a, is a very good start to, 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 to the report. So um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll thank you and I will, uh, I'll close, uh, close the session now. Uh, thank you very much.